This video is all about running the Wave Echo Cave, room by room, encounter by encounter. This big old dungeon is the finale of the Lost Minds of Phandelver. In the previous video, I talked about this finale in general terms. I talked about the way I'd abstract the dungeon and run it without a map, but now we're diving into the nitty gritty about how to run the Wave Echo Cave in a more traditional way. Hey, I just wanted to pop up real quick and say, this is the last day that you can submit your entry to our competition to win a copy of Tasha's Culture and Everything. This is the last day. You have like 12 hours. So if you haven't entered, enter, because we've only had five entrances so far. I'm giving away three copies. I've only had five entries. What is this? Enter the competition. Last day today. Come on. Big competition going on over here. Part one. What to tell your players about the dungeon. There are three things that you 100% need to tell your players about this dungeon. You could fit these little facts into like a role-playing exposition scene, but I think it's better to just be direct with the players and say to them directly these three things. The first is that the goal of the Wave Echo Cave is to find the Forge of Spells. If the players could secure the Forge of Spells before the Black Spider does, then that would mean the party would have the advantage. The second fact is that the Black Spider is competing with the players and roaming the dungeon. If the Black Spider gets to the Forge of Spells first, then she'll become more powerful. And the third is that each time the party takes a short rest or spends an arbitrarily long amount of time on some task, then the clock is ticking. And each tick, you're gonna determine by the roll of a D10 whether the Black Spider gets access to the Forge of Spells during that rest, and she'll attack the party with their supercharged abilities. If you roll a 1 to a 9 on your D10, then everything's fine. But if you roll a 10, which is a 0 on a D10, then it's on, and the Black Spider's gonna attack. Now, if the Black Spider's in possession of the Mysterious Puzzle Box or the item inside the Mysterious Puzzle Box, then make your roll with disadvantage, because she's gonna have to contend with the Forge's Guardian. On the first roll, or the first tick, just roll your D10 normally. On your second tick, roll it normally again. But from the third tick, slash the third rest onwards, start rolling with advantage because it's more likely that she would succeed given more time. Part 2. Using a map for the biblical cave. And with all that squared away, you're almost ready to get exploring this dungeon. But first, you need to work out how you're going to map this massive dungeon because there are 20 numbered rooms in the Wave Echo Cave and your job is to communicate the party's location to your players. It's a big job, but you shouldn't take the easy route of just plonking a big old map down on the table because if you reveal the whole map, then it's clear where the players are meant to go. For some dungeons, that's not so much of a big deal, but for a mega dungeon, it might spoil your fun a bit. Even the shape of the dungeon is a little bit of a spoiler. Just like the mazes on the back of the kids' menus at Macca's, if you start at the bottom left, then your goal is to get into the top right. Basic maze math. Everybody knows that. A lot of dungeon masters will rely on their descriptions to paint the shape of the dungeon, maybe even drawing the map as they go, and that's a fine way to play. And it's good because it lets you make adjustments on the fly, but it can be difficult to keep track of this many rooms. Plus, a bunch of these rooms are quite samesy, and I know I would have trouble differentiating between them as a player. So I've made these little room cards to show the shape of the dungeon. The idea is to place these on the table face down, and when the players show up to a room, you can flip it up. And I'd recommend you use this picture to remember how it's all arranged, which I tweeted like a year ago. And you could make these cards yourself, or you could just come over to Patreon and get the fancy pre-made version up here. The trick here though is remember, only place these cards down, face down, as they explore, and then flip them up as they enter the room. Part three, injecting lore into the wave echo cave. Since we're going to the trouble of running almost every room in this massive dungeon, we should try to make it interesting and relevant at every opportunity. So I want to scatter these little tidbits of lore throughout this whole dungeon. This is not my usual style of play. This is not my usual style of exposition because I don't normally run mega dungeons, but I think this could work really well. The dungeon lore for the Wave Echo Cave is explained in the first two paragraphs of the background section, all the way back in the introduction of this adventure. The main points are, number one, ages ago, a bunch of people formed the Fandelver Pact to share the mind's riches. Number two, spellcasters joined the Alliance and made the Forge of Spells inside. Number three, orcs and evil wizards attacked and ransacked the place. Number four, is that four? There we go. The battle was destructive and huge portions of the mine were destroyed and lost and the whole landscape was changed. Number five, hardly anybody survived. Throughout this dungeon, there are a lot of rooms with zero purpose. So whenever you look at a room and go, ugh, why is this here? Then I want you to find a way to insert some of this lore into the scene somehow. If you're interested, I've made a bunch of handouts and letters, scraps of history that you can sprinkle throughout the dungeon to add some life, some real practical handouts and loot for your players. Here's an example. Heaps of these are available to my patrons. You can click up here to get your own copy. Part 4. Wave Echo Cave. Room by room. Eh, hey, forget about it. 
Hey, now we're getting off to the juicy bit. All right. But before we get there, please subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already done it before, I need your help. Share this video with your mates. Talk about it all the time because I want to get this series out there. I think it's a great series. I want you to share it with your players after you're done running the game. And tell me the story about how you went in the Wave Echo Cave in the comments down below. Now let's get into it. Throughout this whole dungeon, I want you to remember that you have a very versatile tool at your disposal. And that tool is the Black Spider because this whole thing is arranged in a very particular way where there are only three ways to encounter the Black Spider. The first way is the party discovers the forge spells, so the Black Spider ambushes them, or you roll a 10 during a short rest or a tick of time. That means that the Black Spider finds the forge spells, so she ambushes them. Or the third one is that if you decide that the game is over and you go, I just, I'm bored, I wanna finish this, so the Black Spider attacks, end of game. But she has another purpose as well. When we're going through each of these encounters, if you find to yourself, ugh, I don't wanna include this encounter, then you can just skip it. And if the encounter is one of the Black Spider's allies, like the bugbears, you can just say they got killed by ghouls or something. Otherwise, if the encounter is one of the general evil things, like the ghouls, then you can just say that the black spider has already been here, she's been roaming, and she's already defeated this encounter. And you can leave spider webs or a dead spider there as an indicator that she's been there. 20 rooms in this dungeon. This is gonna be a monster. Let's do it. Let's go. Room one, the cave entrance. The entrance tunnel leads to a large cavern supported by a natural pillar of rock and containing three staglomites. In the western part of the cave, behind the column of rock, are three bedrolls and a heap of ordinary supplies. Sacks of flour, bags of salt, casks of salted meat, lanterns, flasks of lamp oil, pickaxes, shovels, and other gear. Amid the supplies, you see the body of a dwarf miner, dead for at least a week. The northeastern section of the cavern has collapsed, forming a 10 foot wide, 20 foot deep pit. A sturdy hemp rope is tied around one of the nearby staglomites and dangles down the side of the pit at the bottom of which is a rough hewn tunnel heading northwest and east. So Gundren has two brothers, Thardin and Nundro. We use Thardin's corpse as a clue back in episode four of this series, and the second brother is meant to be here. I would personally have Nundro be dead at the entrance here as a way to get rid of Gundren, because he would have to go to the funeral or something or take the body back to be prepared. But if you want, instead of Nundro's corpse, you could say that he's alive and being held prisoner in room 20 of this dungeon. And there's just a sign of a scuffle here in room one. But I think that would add a competing goal to this dungeon, one that I'm not particularly interested in. I mean, we've already had to rescue one dwarf Gundren. Do we have to rescue your brother as well? Come on. Either way, there's meant to be the brother's boots of striding and springing here according to the module, but not now version there's not. Imagine if Gundren saw the party stealing his dead brother's boots. That's not something I'd be comfortable role playing. Instead, let's move the magical boots to room two, which is the mine tunnels. And we'll say that these boots never belong to the Rockseeker brothers at all, because we don't loot friends, do we? No, we don't loot friends, we don't loot them. There's also this 20 foot hole that the party has to climb down, taking 2d6 damage if they fall the whole way. Putting this slight inconvenience to enter the dungeon is a cute little way to signal that this is gonna be a dangerous place. I like it. Room two, the mine tunnels. This area consists of numerous intersecting passages. The ceilings here are only six feet high and several of the passages end in partially excavated rock faces. This room is meant to be a labyrinth with a monster hunting its halls and sliding along the roof. Rather than describe this maze like one of those old school first person RPGs where the players decide whether you go left or right, I reckon you could use this little puzzle mechanic to shorthand it. So there are five exits to this maze and one combat encounter, right? So let's just roll a D6. Get a marching order to determine who's in the front and who's in the back, and they have to pick one character for each position. The person in the front is the leader, and they get to roll a D6 to determine what happens. Once they've rolled a number once, the party knows that number's location, and they can go there through the maze without rolling for next time. If the leader is proficient in survival, then they never even have to roll. They can just pick a number at random. That's fine. In my script, I wrote down, make a joke about the count from Sesame Street, but I don't, I think I was drinking when I wrote this. I don't know what the joke is. I don't know how to include it, so I'm just saying this. So on the D6, up on the screen, here is how all the numbers correlate to different locations in different events. I'm not gonna read this out loud because it's a tongue twister. <laughs> if you hit the combat encounter, then the monster is gonna attempt to ambush the player at the back of the marching order. So get that player to roll a perception check versus the Oka Jelly stealth check. If the player wins, then start combat as normal. If the jelly wins, then the party's gonna be surprised and the jelly will attack that character at the back. And inside the jelly, floating there, all creepily-like, is the magical boots of striding and springing that we moved here. And since they're magical, they can't be destroyed by, just destroyed? Destroyed by the jelly's magical acid stuff. I don't know, it's a fantasy game. Destroyed, ugh. Room three, the old entrance. 
Many tunnels intersect at this natural 30-foot high cavern. The walls are carved with simple reliefs showing dwarf and no miners hard at work. Below them, nearly two dozen skeletons in rusted scraps of armour are scattered across the cavern floor. Some are dwarf skeletons, while others are orc remains. Half a dozen large brass lanterns stand in the niches or on the ledges around the cavern, but none are lit. If you only take one thing away from this guide, please listen to this. These Sturges in this encounter are deadly. They have a plus five to hit. Each hit attaches the Sturge to that player with a little bit of nominal damage, but then they do a guaranteed 10 damage when they detach. That's like a mini magic missile, and there are nine of them. Do not run this combat encounter. Instead, I want you to treat this encounter like a trap. These Sturges are one big swarm of mosquito bats, and if the players set off this trap or fail to disarm it, then they, these bat things, they're gonna flood the room, and they're gonna attack each player once. Give each player a strength save to resist being latched onto, and they take 2d6 damage on a fail. If the party wants to travel through this room, then they need to beat a DC 15 stealth check as a group. So the party needs at least half of them to succeed. A natural one counts as two failures, and a natural 20 counts as two successes. A single player could attempt a DC 15 animal handling check to chase off the Sturges, and regardless of what method the players choose, like I want to lure them away, or I want to blast a fireball at them, treat it as an animal handling check. If they fail the check, then trap springs as normal. I love that they're disarming a trap with animal handling. It's cool. Regardless, this trap can only be sprung once, because when the Sturges attack, they leave directly afterwards. And it's up to you, the Dungeon Master, to decide whether they leave the dungeon altogether and go live happily ever after, or whether they move and reset in a different room and just kind of roost there. That would be frustrating. <laughs> room 4, the old guard room. Splintered stone benches and heaps of rubble from a partially collapsed ceiling fill this room. Amid ruined stone bunks and toppled weapon racks are the bones of several dwarves and orcs. This guard room has nine skeletons, and that's a lot, but your party should be able to take it. I would recommend you skip this encounter unless you can add some interesting loot or lore to make it worthwhile. Maybe a journal entry, insert plug for Patreon here. Ooh. Room five, the Assayer's office. This chamber was once an office or a storeroom of some kind. A large stone counter bisects the room set with three dusty balance scales made of iron. Cubby holes carved into the north wall are stuffed with dusty paper scraps. Several long dead corpses, gnomes and orcs by their look, are sprawled across the room. You might be asking, what the bloody hell is an assayer? Well, I took the liberty of Googling it because I didn't know. And it turns out it's the person that tests metals for purity. So the treasure in this room is just entirely money, which is entirely useless for the party in this situation. Where are they going to spend it? So you should replace this treasure with something that's even slightly useful. Maybe still relevant to an assayer. What about a potion that makes you able to see the metals in ores easier, right? And it gives dark vision to 60 feet in the mine. That might be fun. Room 6. The South Barracks. Old stone bunks in orderly rows line the walls of this chamber, and a corroded iron brazier full of old coal stands near the middle of the room. The bones of a half dozen dwarves and orcs lie strewn about, clad in scraps of armour. Three grey, hunched figures squat among the remains, pouring at the scraps and gnawing on the bones. There are meant to be three ghouls in this room, but I want you to bleed this encounter into room nine. Just bleed them together because they're all full of ghouls. And we're gonna try and evoke that feeling from the Fellowship of the Ring when all those monsters are swarming into the room from the Mines of Moria. Ah, oh, so cool. So there's a trick here though. If the players have already cleared the Great Hall in room nine, already killed those ghouls, then just say that this is an empty room because by that point, we'll be sick of ghouls. But if they haven't cleared room nine, then here's what you're gonna do. When you draw your battle map, include some space around the outside for hallways on the outside of the room. And yeah, players, on round one, there's just three ghouls in here. That's, that's easy, right? But at the start of round two, another ghoul comes screaming around the corner from room nine. And at the start of round three, then two more come from a different direction. At the start of round four, another one slides into the player's DMs and it's all trouble from here. So you want this whole encounter to be seven or eight ghouls and it counts as clearing both the south barracks here and the Great Hall in room nine. So the players might wanna flee and that's totally okay. They try to leave at least one passage clear without being full of ghouls so the players have an option to escape. You need to add something worthwhile for loot in this room because this fight could prove to be a big dramatic moment. This is the barracks, right? And this is your final dungeon of the campaign. So maybe a suit of half plate medium armor or splint heavy armor, maybe plate, full plate, I don't know. Go wild, it's the finale, yeah. Room seven, the ruined storeroom. The eastern wall of this chamber has collapsed into a mass of rubble. To the north, a door stands ajar, leading to a good-sized storeroom. 
On the wall is a sign that says, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Dusty kegs are tucked away neatly against the walls, all of them cracked and split open from age. The module says that this is a safe spot to rest, but that's not particularly relevant to the way we're running this dungeon. So I guess this room is just empty? Normally I don't include empty rooms in my planning, but since I've already covered how I'd cut 90% of this dungeon in this previous video up here, I figured it would be unfair to cut any rooms in this video. You got, you got lucky room seven, you get to stay, I guess. Room eight, the fungi cavern. Dense carpets of weird fungi cover large sections of the floor in this cavern. The growth includes puffballs a foot across, weird shelf fungus growing on staglomites, and large stalks and caps a good five feet tall. Some of the puffballs glow with an eerie green phosphorescence. Mushroom room. Mushroom room. Mushroom room. I like the mushroom room, yeah. I think that this spore trap is the perfect hazard. It visually communicates its threat super well. So the players are gonna immediately think of countermeasures to protect themselves in this instance. And it's just a single roll to get through the whole thing. I love it. When the players cross this room, ask each of them to describe the way they cross, the way their characters carry themselves. If any of the players describe themselves covering their faces or taking measures to protect their breathing, they give them advantage on their constitution save. And anyone who fails takes 3d6 poison damage and suffers from the poison condition until the next encounter or until the next tick of time, you know how we're tracking time, the next tick of time passes. Room 9, the Great Cavern. Steep escarpments divide this large cavern into three sections, high ledges at either end and a lower section in the middle. Carved stone stairs climb to the ledges. Two large tables stand in the middle section along with a pair of old braziers. A smaller table stands on the eastern ledge. The skeletal remains of a dozen dead warriors Dwarves, gnomes, orcs, and ogres attest to the fierceness of the fighting that took place here long ago. Here's the thing, I'm not sure this ghoul fight is very interesting when you divorce it from the reinforcement mechanic that I suggested for room six in the south barracks. So feel free to skip this encounter or change it up if you want. The purpose of this room is to illustrate the big battle that took place in the Wave Echo Cave. I think it would be cool to have a Boondock Saint style repainting of this battle where you describe the blows that killed each ancient combatant in a kind of flashback scene. Yeah, that'd be rad. Room 10, the dark pool. A still pool fills much of this cavern, the water is dark, revealing little of what might lie within. The shore of the pool consists of a thin layer of broken shells from strange pale mussels and a fishy odour hangs in the air. This is a very simple room. If any of the players want to search the room or specifically the pool, then ask them to make a DC 15 perception check to notice a skeleton at the bottom of the pool. If they fail and seem unhappy, then say they can spend a whole tick of time to search around the room thoroughly and roll your black spider dice. If they do that, then they will automatically find the skeleton at the bottom that has three platinum wings, wings, three platinum rings and a wand of magic missile. Room 11, the North Barracks. Old stone bunks line the walls of this barracks, which is lit and heated by a glowing iron brazier in the middle of the room. Across the room is another door. This one is blocked by a barricade made from the remains of a wooden table. The book wants there to be a bunch of bugbears in here, but we're not gonna do that. This room is empty, but there are signs that the bugbears have been bunking here and that they're affiliated with the black spider. The door on the right is gonna be barricaded. My most recent party committed a war crime in this room and I'll share the story in the pinned comment downstairs. But remember, I also wanna hear your stories about the Wave Echo Cave downstairs as well. I wish my players hadn't committed that war crime, but leave, leave your comment down below. <laughs> Room 12, the smelter cavern. A large blast furnace and a mechanical bellows powered by a water wheel dominate this large chamber. The furnace is cold and dark, but heaps of coal are piled nearby, along with carts full of unrefined ore. The water wheel sits in a 10 foot wide channel cut into the floor of the room, but the channel is dry. Passages exit to the west, south and east. The chamber channel exits to the north and east. This is my favourite encounter in the dungeon. There's meant to be a flame skull here and a bunch of zombies in this room. Zombies are meant to pursue the players for one round and then lose interest. But I think that's kind of confusing for the players and it means any damage they output on the zombies is kind of wasted. Instead, let's say it's just the flame skull here. And then there's a carpet of like melted, grabby zombie hands and bits which act as difficult terrain for some parts, which means each square costs double, double movement. And when you're playing the flame skull, friendly dungeon master, cast fireball at your earliest opportunity. It's the best way to start combat. Room 17, the old steam bed. 
This passageway is barely four feet high and is obstructed by rounded boulders and pebbles. It might have been a steam bed, though no water flows through here now. Room 17, the old steam bed. This room is just a shortcut to avoid the flame skull encounter. It connects room 16 and room 18. Nothing to show here. Room 18, the collapsed cavern. A wide rift fills the eastern half of this cavern. A stream pours down the west wall and then tumbles down into the rift and flows out again to the north. Several ropes are secured to iron stakes along the western edge of the rift, leading down to the chasm floor. The module wants there to be a bugbear and a doppelganger encounter in this room, but I would just skip it. Either this room is empty, or there are a bunch of dead bugbears in here, killed by ghouls. There's meant to be some great loot here as well, the gauntlets of ogre power, but instead I want to move those gauntlets to room 16, which is the booming cavern, and we'll get why a little bit later. Room 19, the Temple of Dumathoin. Six cracked marble pillars line the walls of this hall, at the north end of which stands a nine-foot-tall statue of a dwarf seated on a throne and a mighty stone warhammer laying across his lap. Large emeralds gleam in the statue's eyes. Some bugbears stand by a table, flanking a dark elf dressed in black leather armour and robes. She clutches a black staff with a carved spider at the top and frowns as she sees you. It seems that I must deal with you myself. A pity that it must end this way. They found it. This is the Black Spider's home base in the dungeon, but she's not here. Instead, the five bugbears we removed from the North Barracks, we're moving them here. And if Monteith the Doppelganger is still alive, then he could replace one of the bugbears disguised as the Black Spider. There are three pieces of treasure in this room. There's a key to room 20, there's all this money, and then there's this note suggesting that the Black Spider found a powerful magical item in room 16, but she couldn't work out how to collect it. This is referring to the gauntlets of ogre strength that we moved there. So we're gonna do this little treasure hunt to direct the party from the top left in the dungeon to the top right, near the Forge of Spells, where our climax is. Room 20, the priest's quarters. Dusty draperies adorn the walls of this room, which also contain a bed and a brazier. A badly disheveled dwarf lies bound and unconscious on the cold stone floor. If you decide that Nundro is alive, then he's here. Or if some other character has been kidnapped by the Black Spider, then they're here. Or even, if your party gets wiped out in this dungeon, then maybe they could wake up in this room as prisoners. Prison stuff is the only purpose of this room. Otherwise, feel free to cut it. Room 16, The Booming Cavern. A narrow ledge overlooks a large cavern that houses a surging, seething body of water. The rhythmic booming heard throughout the mines is louder here. At regular intervals, a fresh surge of water funnels into this chamber and slams against the walls just below the ledge. The echo suggests that this cave might be just one arm of a much larger cavern to the north East. This is the source of that booming sound that resonates throughout the whole dungeon. Wherever the players are in the Wave Echo Cave, feel free to describe the direction that this crashing sound is coming from, because if they follow it, they're going to be heading towards the Forge of Spells, which is going to drive the plot forward. Now remember, we moved the gauntlets of giant strength or ogre strength or whatever they are, we moved them here. So let's just say these gauntlets are so magical and so heavy that the crashing water doesn't move them. Without the black spider's notes or without a detect magic spell, they just collect rocks in the water and the players won't be able to find them. The players have the option of either rolling a very hard athletics check to retrieve them, like a DC 18, or they can spend a tick of time to automatically get them. If a player fails their ability check, that athletics check, then let's say they take 2d6 bludgeoning damage. Because remember visually, we've got this base where the water is rushing in and rushing out, um, you know, a couple of minute intervals, and the players would have to scramble down there and get in the water and dive and grab these gauntlets and come back in without getting smashed against the rocks. So that's the challenge here that's represented by that athletic check. Room 13, the Starry Cavern. Glittering minerals in the ceiling of this large cavern catch the light and send it back to create the impression of a starry night sky. Dozens of skeletons, many crushed under fallen debris, are scattered across the floor. The cave is large enough that it contains two freestanding structures. Each of these stone buildings is proportioned for human use, as opposed to the dwarf side doorways and furnishings you've seen everywhere else in the mines. Both structures have battered and blackened masonry walls, their double doors cracked and scorched. The cavern is divided by an escarpment, into which a flight of stairs has been cut. Passages lead out of this area to the north, south, and west. Rooms 13, 14, and 15, this is where the magic happens. I want you to pretend this whole section is blank if you want. You can put whatever you want here. This is where your guardian comes into play. This is where your vision for the mysterious puzzle box takes shape. This is where you make the Lost Minds of Fandelva special for your group. Room 13 and 14 aren't too important, so we're not going to go too deep here. In the book, room 13 is meant to be the Starry Cavern, which is just a big, fancy corridor, and that's fine. Room 14, 
the wizard's quarters. Dust, ash, walls blackened by fire, and heaps of debris beneath the sagging ceiling show that this room was damaged by a destructive blast. The furnishings, tables, chairs, bookshelves, beds, are charred or splintered, but otherwise well-preserved. A scorched iron chest stands near the foot of one of the beds. This is where Mormask the Wraith is. He's this dangerous ghost who's willing to parley with the party, but the adventure's done zero work to foreshadow this encounter. And I don't think it's really worth including at all. You should put something more interesting here, or cut it. Or you should foreshadow Mormask in some way. Room 15, The Forge of Spells. This large workshop was badly damaged by the ancient spell battle that laid waste to the mine. Work tables taking up two corners of the room are scorched, and the plaster has been burned off the masonry walls. In the middle of the room, a stone pedestal holds a small brazier in which an eerie green flame dances and crackles. The brazier and its pedestal appear to have been untouched by the forces that destroyed the area. Behind the brazier of green flame floats a spherical creature, measuring roughly four feet in diameter. Four eye stalks protrude from its central mass, two on each side, in the centre of its body is a large eye that stares at you. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, says a thick, burbling voice inside your head. More than likely, the Forge of Spells is where the final fight is going to happen. I want you to pay attention to where the puzzle box is. If the party has it, that means that they get here first. This means that they have the opportunity to disactivate the Guardian, deactivate the Guardian, and loot the room. There are two magic weapons here, and if the party's real quick on their feet, they might be able to have the chance to enchant one piece of their own gear. But then, bam, the Black Spider approaches. If the Black Spider has the puzzle box, though, that means that she got here first. That means that she deactivates the Guardian, and the party stumbles on her at the exact dramatic moment when she activates the forge. If she activates the forge, that means we're going to buff her a bit. Maybe that means all of her spider's attacks count as plus one magical weapons. Or maybe it means she's upcasting all of her spells by one level. Maybe she means she gets extra legendary resistances? I don't know. Just give her a little mechanical boost along with a nice visual to symbolize that she's more powerful now. If you're at all confused about the mysterious puzzle box or the guardian, I covered those ideas extensively in the previous video, link up here. Also in that previous video, I talked about how how I'd run an epilogue for this campaign, so I'd recommend you check that out too. Now that was a long video. Hey, right now I am live on Twitch, Matthew Perkins DM on Twitch, and I'm responding to your YouTube comments right now, okay? After every premiere, I'll be live on Twitch responding to your comments. So leave a comment, stop by Twitch, and say good day. Thank you very much to all my patrons down here, all these lovely people for their support, and thank you for watching. It's been great. I'll see you next time.